Welcome to Thrive Church. We are so happy to have you here with us today. My name is Judah. I'm lead pastor here. And we welcome you at all of our campuses, Torrington, New Britain, Terryville Online, on TV, wherever it is that you may be watching or listening. We welcome you. We are so glad uh, to have you. And we are uh, in our 21-day fast. We started uh, this past week. And, uh, and if you are doing that with us, man, we are so excited for you. You've probably had some, some days where you were a little bit hungry, maybe a little bit hangry. Angry, but hopefully through that, it helped you to get into God's word and remember that God is with us. And so we are in a series right now called Get a Grip. And we're talking about things that in our life we need to get a grip on. Get a grip on things like get a grip on our priorities. Last week we talked about getting a grip on worshiping God. This week we're talking about getting a grip on on God's word. You know, the Bible says that God's word is full of living power. It's powerful. It's, it's, it's uh, likened to a sword. And this is the only book that has the power to change and transform your life. If you get into God's word, if you begin to read and study and memorize scripture, it will transform your life. It will change your life. There's a lot of other books out there, a lot of self-help books, and they may help you a little bit. But God's word is the only only one that has the power to actually be, uh, transform your life. Now, it's important to realize that the Bible that we have, that it can be trusted. In fact, uh, the, the Bible, the, the New Testament, which is the uh, newest part of the Bible, it kind of documents the life of Jesus, uh, his life, his death, his resurrection, as well as the launch of the early church. Uh, the New Testament has uh, over 25,000 manuscripts that are still in existence. Now, this is more than any other ancient document in human history. There is more documents of the New Testament. In fact, many of them are even from just a few years after the original writing. It has been studied and scrutinized by, by thousands of eyewitnesses, people who were actually there. It's been studied by, by tens of thousands of scholars, both biblical and academic, and it's been used by billions of people every day for them to base their life, their hope, their future, their eternity on the words in this book, in the Bible. Man, the, there is so much in there. This is the best-selling book of all time. I don't know if you know that. Best-selling book of all time. Uh, you think of other best-selling books. Uh, the, one of the other main best-selling books is the, the, uh, one of the first novels ever printed, Don Quixote, you know, the, the knight who fights the windmill. Uh, great story. And um, that has sold 500 million copies in the history of its uh, publishing. Uh, the Tale of Two Cities, another great classic, 200 million uh, Little Prince, 140 million. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone or, or, or the Sorcerer's Stone has sold 120 million copies. The Hobbit, 100 million copies. The Bible has sold 10 times more than the most, than the, than the, first, the second one there, 500 million. So 10 times that, 5 billion copies of the Bible have been sold. Every year, 100 million copies are sold. That means literally every second, three copies are sold. Every second. That's how many are being sold and, and distributed throughout the world. It's the, the book that has been translated into more languages than any other book. Well over a thousand languages God's word has been translated into. And we have it. We have it so readily available. And yet many of us, we're not even super familiar with it. Much less have we actually read it. And, and if you do read it, it's, it's a little bit weird. It's kind of an odd book to read, honestly, because in your notes, we're going to break it down here. The Bible is a collection of 66 books by over 40 authors over a 1,500-year span. Over a 1,500-year span. So, so this is more of a collection of books rather than just a single book. And it has two sections in it. It has the Old Testament and the New Testament, or the Old Contract and the New Contract. The Old Testament pretty much documents the history of the Jewish people. And it was originally written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Then the New Testament, this primarily documents, as I just said, the life, in, uh, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, as well as the start of the early church. And that was written in Greek. Then around 405 uh, AD, uh, it was translated from those languages into Latin. 
and that was called the Latin Vulgate by some guy. We only know of him as the name Jerome. So this guy took the original languages, translated it into Latin. Then in the 1450s, it was the first book ever to be printed on a movable type printing press, the Gutenberg Press, the Gutenberg Bible. Maybe you've seen one. I saw one. They have one uh, in New Haven in their antique uh, book section, and it's amazing to see, but that was the first book printed on a movable type press. Then in 1382, there was a guy by the name of John Wycliffe, and he was the first person to translate the Bible into English. But he didn't go from the original languages. He went from Latin into English. So you can think, like, like it's got from a translation to a translation to a translation. or The original Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, into Latin, and then ultimately into English in 1382. Now, it seems like a good thing. But you wouldn't believe how many people have given their lives so that we can have these here with us today. You wouldn't believe it. For example, John Wycliffe, the first person to translate it into English, well, he made some enemies because of the fact that he did this. Some of the words that he cho chose to use, it frustrated the church powers that be at the time. One of the words that, they, that was really a, a, a controversial one is this word. It was the original in the Greek. It was ekklesia, which in the English means a gathering. But he, uh, the, but the, the, the people at large, the church of the day, they wanted that word to be church. Because when you think of church, you think of architecture, you think of buildings, you think of going someplace. Well, instead, he translated the word as gathering, and that ruffled some feathers. Now, the church would have killed him, however, he died of a stroke, and so they weren't able to put him to death. But they still called him a heretic, and they disliked him so much that he was buried on church property. They actually dug up his bones, his body, they burned it and threw it in the river and burned everything he wrote because he, they felt that he was undermining the power of the church because he said, our faith should be based on the Bible alone. Then in 1526, William Tyndale he translated the Bible from the original languages, not from Latin this time. He went to the original languages, made the first translation into English, and as you can imagine, everybody was so happy, right? No, absolutely not. They burned him at the stake. They killed him because they didn't want the Bible to be in the hands of the normal people. They wanted the priests to be the only ones who could read it. So that way, if you wanted to know God, you had to come to church, you had to give your money, you had to listen to their priests, say whatever they wanted, and you had no way to verify the validity of what they were saying because you didn't have God's word in our modern language. In 1560, they had the Geneva Bible. This is the first one that divided it into chapters and books, and this was easier for you to, to go and reference and find things. But then, again, people didn't like it because it used that word you know, in many cases, use the word community, use the word uh, gathering instead of the word church. And so the established church of the day, they wanted to be the primary people. The person that it ticked off the most was a guy by the name of King James. And King James did not like the fact that this English Bible was undermining the state-established church. He wanted everybody to come to his building, not, not have some gathering out in a field that they could call you know, their worship of God. No, you had to come to the church. So as a result, he outlawed all the Bibles and he commissioned his own Bible to be translated and he says, you can translate it as accurately as you can, but when you translate the word ecclesia, it cannot be used as gathering. It has to be used as the word church. And that is the King James Bible that we have. It was primarily, primarily, it was actually William Tyndale's Bible, but they just made a few modifications, that being one of them. So many times we, people will come up and ask me, what's the best translation to read? Which one is the best? And, and my answer is always the same. It's the one that you'll actually read. And it's the one that you'll actually apply. Because here's the thing. I, I, people come and say, well, but this is the most accurate Bible. No, this is the one. That's, and I'm like, how often do you read it? Well, I don't read it, but Lord knows if I was going to read it, I'd read the accurate one. It's like, well, if you're not reading it, it ain't doing you any good anyhow, buddy. You know, it, it's important that we get into it, that we read it, and that we apply God's word. So the question that I have for you today that we should ponder is, in your notes, is, is God's word a priority in your life? It's God's word a priority. You know, you know what a lot of us do? We'll start reading the Bible, 
And then we'll see something like, oh, ooh, I don't like what that says. You know what we do? You know what a lot of times we do when we don't like what it says? You know what? Nope, not going to read that one. <laughs> oh, here we go. You know, I don't like this whole chapter. There we go. Some of you are like, are you going to get struck by lightning? You're ripping a Bible in church. I honestly don't know. So if I do, it's been nice knowing you. Going through, oh, you know what? I don't like this either. No, nope, no, nope. not going to read that one. And, and, and we go through, and, we, and we, we take out the things that we don't. We ignore the things that we dislike. Is God's word a priority in our life? Or we say, well, you know what? I, I like some of it. You know, God is love. But, but, you know, this whole thing about him punishing sin, like, those, like I don't want to hear anything about that. Then other people, you know what people say? It's so funny. People say, well, the Bible is open to interpretation. Have you ever heard somebody say something like that before? Well, the Bible is open to interpretation. Like, what does that even mean? Like, I'm going to interpret what you just said however I want to. That's basically what they say. Like, I'm going to read God's word, and I'll just interpret it however I want. It's like a parent telling a child, clean your room. Well, this is open to interpretation. <laughs> Maybe you mean clean the air in the room, and I'll spray some Lysol in the air, and that'll clean. It's like, no, 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 it's not open for interpretation. I mean, get in there and clean the room. See, it's up to us to discover what God meant in these words. It's pretty clear. Are we anchored to God's word or not? So the three things that we need to do when it comes to God's word is that we need to read, reflect, respond. Read, reflect, and respond. The first one is in your notes, that we read God's word. Read God's word. I would encourage you that consistency is more important than, than progress. Like, you, you know, I mean, I know right now we're in a 21-day uh, fast, and many of us are reading through either the book of John or reading through the, the New Testament, or, or maybe you're reading through the whole Bible. Maybe you're doing different plans. I don't know. But, but we're trying to, like, like make progress, and we're, that's all well and good. What's important is consistency, Right? It's important that we just get in God's word on a regular basis. This is why I've tried to encourage people, like, even five minutes a day. Like, just get in the Bible for five minutes a day. I mean, most of us could spend five, that's about one chapter. And if you did that, I believe that it will begin to transform your life. It says in Psalm 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. A lamp for my feet and a light for my path. It's like, this is my, my headlamp I use when I go hiking sometimes. I can see you guys really good, but I don't know if you guys see me that way. Here, you know what? I'll dim it. Is that better? It's still blinding you, right? You know, it seems really bright, but, but honestly, like when I go out in the woods with this on, it's not as bright as it seems, right? It's like it'll, it'll illuminate a small area so that I can see where I'm going so I don't trip over something, but it doesn't. Uh, illuminate the entire trail. It doesn't illuminate the entire path. And, and what it says here, it says, your word, God's word, is a lamp to my feet, to guide my feet, and a light for my path. In other words, he's saying, he says, I'm going to illuminate. God's word is going to direct your next step. When I go into the woods of this, it may be super dark out, and I can't see very far. Maybe I can only see 5 or 10, 15 feet in front of me. That's okay. That's all I need to see. It's enough to see my next step, my next move, but I can't see the end of the trail. And we like to, to focus on the future and our big dreams and our long-term goals and what's your five- and ten-year plan. I don't know. God's Word may not illuminate all of that for us. But what it does say is that it's going to help us to take our next step. It's going to help us take our next step. God's Word promises to direct the next step, not necessarily the long term. It's a lamp for our feet, not a spotlight off in the distance. So if we want to grow spiritually, if we want to grow in our faith in God, we have to read and study and love the Word of God. In your notes, you can't grow as a follower of Jesus without being in Scripture. You know, there's a lot of people that have a lot of ideas. They're like, well, you know what? God is still speaking, so I'm just going to pray, and I'm just going to trust that he's going to tell me whatever he wants me to do, and I don't need to be in the Bible at all. No, that, that, that's not true at all. See, we need to get into God's Word. See, and this is not just, you know, coming to church. You know, coming to church is great, uh, but this is not just coming to church. It's not just watching Christian TV, watching a, a sermon on YouTube somewhere. Nothing takes the place of personal Bible reading. And, and this is where, you know, I encourage you to read it every single day, even if it's just for a few minutes. You want to hear God speak in your life? Most of us would like that. But in your notes, God speaks to us primarily through the Bible. 
That's how he's going to speak to us. He's going to speak to us through the Bible. It's not going to be like, like some, you know, disembodied voice out of the sky, you know, like Monty Python or something like that. It's nothing like that. We're reading God's word and something jumps off the page like, wow, that really relates to the situation that I'm in right now. This is not something that you outgrow. This is not something that, that you say, well, you know, I've been following God for five years now. I really don't need scripture anymore. No, this isn't something that we outgrow. It says in Hebrews 5.12, it says, you've been believers for so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. A lot of people talk about the milk of the word versus the meat of the word. The milk versus the meat. What does it mean to have, to have milk? I mean, if you think about it, really, if you think about it, milk is just pre-digested meat, right? The mom eats the meat, makes the milk, the baby takes the milk, right? So, so this is, this is, you know, when we talk about having the, the milk, it's like when we come, maybe you, you hear a, a sermon, maybe you read a devotional, something like that, that's a pre-digested meal. Somebody like myself spends time studying something, and then we, we disseminate it, we talk about it, and you hear that, that's great, it's good for you to hear, but, but that's not enough, it's not enough. It's great to listen to sermons, and it's great to get into devotionals, but in your notes, nothing takes the place of consistently reading the Bible, consistently being in God's Word on a regular basis. This isn't something that we outgrow. If you desire to have a relationship with God, this is so important. This is our desire as a church, is just to inspire people to read the Bible. That's it. Like, that's my goal, like, in life. That's, that's my main goal, is, like, if I can inspire a few people to read the Bible, well, then, then I've been successful. Like, that's, that's legitimately it. I just want you to read the Bible. Even if it's five minutes a day, just read the Bible, and I'll have considered myself a success. So if you want to make me feel good about myself, just go read your Bible, okay, for crying out loud. It's not that hard. Um, but think about it. Like, like if you just come, out, come to church once a week, like, you're just missing out on so much, right? It says in Job chapter 23, Verse 12, says, I've not departed from his commands, but have treasured his words more than my daily food. Like, how much do we treasure our daily food? Like, some of us, we're like, man, I just thought I was going to skip breakfast this week, and man, I'm just miserable. I'm just miserable. I'm making everybody miserable around me. Like, we, we miss one meal, and man, we're, we're miserable. Some of us, you, maybe you can go a little bit longer. But here he says, he says, I treasure God's words more than my daily food. More than the food that I have to eat. Like, that's how much I desire God's word. We're in a 21-day fast right now. Some of us are, are missing a meal. And we begin to realize really fast that you can't just eat one time a week and stay healthy. Like, you can't just eat once and stay healthy. So why do we try to sustain our spiritual life just simply by being in God's word once a week when we come to church? For 30 minutes, for crying out loud. 30 minutes, that's it. Like, 30 minutes. And we come, and you hear somebody talking, and yeah, it's great for a while. You start to grow a little bit. You're like, wow, that really stood out to me. But eventually, you feel like you stop growing. You're not growing as much as you used to. And then you start saying, well, I don't know. I just I feel like I'm not being fed. You know, I've been in ministry for like a lot, a lot of years. Um, and over the years, I've heard so many people, and they'll leave a church. And you know what their excuse always is? Or not always, but a lot of times is they just say, I'm not getting fed. I'm not getting fed. And my, my question to them is always the same. I'm like, how often do you read the Bible? And they're like, well, you know, um, I, not as much as I should, I'm sure, but, you know, I'm just not getting fed. I'm like, oh, so you want me to spoon feed you. That's what you want, right? Like babies get spoon fed, but bigger kids, they start to feed themselves. You know that, right? You know if you just come once a week, you're not going to grow to the same rate as if you're actually in God's word on your own. See, like a newborn with milk, yeah, they, they have that and it's good for them, but eventually as they grow, they start to need the solid food. We need to start reading scripture on our own, having our own relationship with God. See, you don't outgrow food, do you? Like, we never outgrow food. It doesn't matter how big we get, how old we get. Like, we're always like, yeah, I, I will still eat food, right? We will always out eat food, most of us three times a day, some of us maybe more than that. Somebody said, well, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to, I've outgrown breathing, right? It's like, if you think you outgrow breathing, you've outgrown life, right? Because we need to breathe in order to live. So, well, I just, I've, I've outgrown needing God's word. No, you don't outgrow it. So the three things was to read, reflect, and respond. The second one, well, the first one was read God's word. The second one in your notes is to reflect on God's word. You want to prosper in 2024? You want to be successful? You want to achieve your 
your goals. Look what it says in Joshua 1.8. He says, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night. That means think about it day and night so that you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. And only then, only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. If you want to have a prosperous new year, you want to have a successful year, Here, he's saying, get into God's word. Now, this isn't saying that if you read the Bible that you're going to be rich. Like, it's not saying that. See, in your notes, God defines success differently than we do. So we need to be very clear. God defines success in a different way than we do. We may define success by a job or our achievements or, or the things that we own or by how many followers we have or how many zeros we have in a bank account. That may be how we define success, but that's not how God defines success. Scripture makes it clear that God defines success in different ways by like right living and and being in harmony with God and with other people. See, that's success in God's eyes. It says in Psalm 119, verse 15, it says, I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your words. It says, I will study and reflect we're, we're reflecting. I, that word reflect is interesting, right? I was studying reflect. That means to, to, to think, to ponder, to, to say, I'm going to reflect on this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about it. But, but then I also think, like, well, what else does reflect mean? Like a mirror reflects, right? Mirror reflects. And what does a mirror reflect? It reflects the object that's standing in front of it. If you have a mirror, it's going to reflect whoever is standing in front of it. And if we are reflecting on God's word, then we should be reflecting God's word into everything that we do. In our words, in our actions, in the things that we do in our life. It should be reflecting God's word as a mirror reflects a person. That we are reflecting God. Are we doing that in our life? See, God's word promises that he'll bring success. And if you find yourself in life feeling unfulfilled, And if you're looking for something possibly to complete you, maybe it's because you need more of God's word in your life. Maybe you need to have that regular discipline. Maybe you need to have that that, that consistency in your life. Some of us, we kind of like binge God's word. Like once a week, I'm just going to get in there. I'll read for an hour and I'll just catch up for my week. And then then I'll just do everything else. No, consistently. I'd rather see you do it consistently. We do so many other things consistently in life. We eat consistently. We watch TV consistently. We go to the bathroom consistently. You know, we do all these other things consistently. But are we in God's word even for five minutes? Even for five minutes. Can't we just give God five minutes of our day? Like, can't we just do that? So we read, we reflect, and we respond. So we read God's word reflect on God's word, the third thing in your notes is to respond to God's word. Respond. Are we responding to God's word? What does that mean? That means that we're taking action on the things that we know, right? I, I mentioned before that, that I, I'm teaching uh, two of my girls how to, how to drive. And it's interesting because as I'm trying to teach them how to drive, I'm trying to like remember myself. Like, how do I drive, you know? And how do I teach this? Like, I was taught how to drive, but I was never taught how to teach somebody how to drive. So I'm thinking, you know, about, about being observant and to look around and to, to see things and to, to be aware and to not be distracted and all of these things. And the other day, I was driving down the road. It was early uh, one morning, early Friday morning, and I'm going to the gym, and I'm just like, you know, I'm just out there just driving, you know, I'm just driving. And I go over a little hill, and I'm just looking around because it's just a beautiful morning. And the next thing I know, boom! I was like, like, what in the world was that? And I'm like, oh, that was a parked car. Well, that wasn't fun. You know, I, I, I ran right into it. And I, here was something, I, I'm trying to teach this, I'm trying to teach my kids, like, oh, be aware, be aware of the parked cars in the road, and here I am, just totally unaware. I wasn't applying what I was teaching, you know? I wasn't applying. A very simple principle of driver's ed is to be aware of your surroundings. See, we need to apply God's word. In, in your notes, knowing God's word and not applying it is pointless, right? Just like me, like, I, I knew what I should do, but I didn't apply it, and it was pointless. If you know what to do, if you know what God's word says, and we don't apply it, it's pointless. It's like knowing that we should drink water, right? Like we all know we should drink water every day, right? We all know however much it is. Drink two quarts of water, whatever they tell you. I don't know. It changes all the time. But we know we should drink water. How many of us actually do it? Eh, probably not that many of us, right? Because we know it, but we don't actually do it. See, being a disciple is all about application. We'll close with these verses in Matthew 7. Jesus is speaking here. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is like a wise person, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Verse 26 says, but anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. I don't know a lot about construction. 
but I'm pretty sure if you're going to build a house, it would be more secure to build it on a rock-solid foundation of stone than to build it on a foundation of sand. In this verse, it goes on to say that the, the house that was built on the rock when the storms come, nothing can shake it, nothing can knock it over, but the house that was built on sand when the storms come and the waves come and the winds come, it, it, it destroys the whole house and it collapses with a terrible crash. That's what it's like when we hear God's word and we don't apply it. See, what we're talking about is getting it from our head to our heart to our actions. As you're reading scripture, we ask ourselves questions like, is there a command that I should keep? Is there an error that I need to avoid? Is there an example that I need to follow? Is there a promise that I can claim? Does this passage maybe highlight an aspect of God's nature I didn't know or a part of his character that he wants to build inside of me? See, ultimately, it's not what you preach that matters. It's what you practice that matters. That's why people think churches are full of hypocrites, right? It's like, oh, you, you just preach this, but you don't practice it. Yeah, well, join the club. We're all trying to figure this out, okay? Like, honestly, we're trying to figure it out. But it's not what we preach that matters. It's what we practice that matters. That's what makes us a follower of Jesus. It's not what you eat that matters. It's what you digest that matters. See, are we digesting? Are we, are we reading? Are we reflecting? And then are we responding to God's word? See, God's word is alive. It is full of power, the power to bring transformation, the power to bring restoration, the power to bring healing, the power to give you wisdom and insight, the power to direct you, to guide you. As it says, his word is a lamp for our feet and a light to our path. God's word and God's word alone has this. No other book has this power to do this, to bring the restoration that we so desperately need in our life, but it's not going to do us any good if we never open it up. It's not going to do us any good if we just leave it on the shelf and never take a look and see. Yeah, sometimes it can be a challenge to read. You started reading in the beginning, you're like, wow, it's just all this, this wars and battles. This is why it's important to, to maybe jump into the New Testament, read the Gospel of John, read, read Luke, something like that, something that, that's a cohesive story about the life of Jesus. And as we get in there, we begin to realize that it's changing us and it's transforming us, not from the outside in. It's not just cleaning us up on the outside, but it's giving us a new heart and making us more like Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you now, and we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your word, which teaches us and directs us and instructs us and guides us. And Lord, I'm sorry for ripping the Bible today. <laughs> but Lord, let it remind us that we should take your word to heart, that we should remember, that we should apply these things into our life, that we should follow your steps and follow your teachings. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, don't let another day go by. We may not have tomorrow. It says in scripture that anyone who believes that God raised Jesus from the dead, so if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you'll be saved. So if that's where you are, why don't you call on his name now and say, Jesus, you're my Lord. I'm deciding to follow you. So God, we come to you now. We thank you for teaching us. We thank you for giving us an instruction book for life that will guide us and direct us through even the darkest days. It'll be with us through the ups and the downs directing us, transforming us, bringing healing and restoration. Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you for that. And we ask you to draw us closer to you through reading your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing.